Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Foxworth Theory. I am your host, Eugenia Foxworth. And we've got a fantastic show lined up today for you. This show is about art, entertainment, fashion, and business. And we will be interviewing the movers and the shakers from all over the world. And we will allow them to tell their stories. Alfred Gallman called The Artistic Son by Alvin Ailey has been a master teacher and choreographer for over 39 years. He has worked with the giants in the dance and theater world, including Alvin Ailey, Tally Beattie, Fred Benjamin, Pepsi Bethel, Gary Deloach, George Faison, Jeffrey Holder, and Mr. Gallman toured with the National Touring Company of the Tony Award winning musical, The Wiz. He was a soloist for eight years with the Fred Benjamin Dance Company, performing in all the largest festivals and venues in the New York tri-state area. Please join me as I welcome Mr. Gallman to the Foxworth Theory. Welcome, Mr. Gallman. And how thank are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you. Well, tell us, how did you get started as a dancer? Well, I danced all my life as a child, and um, I was encouraged to dance by my family. And um, one day I formed a group called the Young Soul Debonairs. There was five fellows who are um, like-minded, and we choreographed and danced throughout the city. And a choreographer saw me, um, we won the talent contest and he said if I ever wanted to seriously dance that he would be willing to train me and when the group broke up I found myself at Clark Center for the Performing Arts taking class with my mentor Pepsi Bethel. Hmm. Amazing some of the things that we go through and not realize. Yes. Um, the effects it's going to have on us. So you've worked with so many brilliant people in the business. What have you learned from these people about the business and staying on top of your game? Well, it doesn't matter how much talent you have if you don't have the right administration and promotion to push you out there you will just flounder. So I tried to get well connected in the um, business area so that um, my product could be recognized. What is your specialty? Jazz, modern, Afro dance, or ballet? It is a combination of all of those, um, which I really got from Alvin Ailey. But um, I was trained in jazz, authentic jazz with Pepsi Bethel. I was trained in contemporary jazz with um, Fred Benjamin. And I was trained with um, modern jazz with Tally Beattie. So I'm a fusion of all of those people and individuals. And of course, Alvin Yes, and if you were trained by Mr. Benjamin, you were trained by <laughs> Bess. Yes, yes. Yes, because I think he um, he was the, uh, I don't know what his position was, but he had a, an executive position at the uh, Alvin Ailey. Am I not co correct? Yes, you are correct. He was in charge of the jazz department. Mm -hmm. So I have very strong roots in jazz. That's why I asked the question. Therefore, you've traveled with 
the iconic national tour, The Wiz, as I, we, I mentioned. What was that like for you? That was uh, such a rewarding um, experience. Um, I had seen The Wiz and that was my dream that one day I would be in, on that stage performing in that production. And um, dancing with Fred Benjamin around the city, I was noted and picked out as a strong soloist. I got a call from the production of The Wiz and asked what I would be um, willing to be a member of their touring company. So that was a wonderful act of faith. At, well, it was supposed to happen. That's the way life is. Yes. And <laughs> so take us back to the group, Sounds of Blackness. How did that happen? Um, and for those who may not know, Sounds of Blackness is a popular group in which Anne Nesby is lead singer. How did you get with, with them? The fabulous Angelo Ellerby. Yes. He hooked me up and we went, we flew out to Minneapolis and we rehearsed and taped at Prince's studio. And um, it was wonderful experience um, to be in Paisley Park and to be around all these legends. And it was the debut video that was produced by Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. So to have all of those people under one roof and the great Prince, we're working in his home and his mansion and his facility was just a lifetime experience for me. That is so, um, so phenomenal. Uh, if I can sidestep, um, did you teach or choreograph something for the Uptown Dance Academy? Yes, I taught with them for years and I've set many of my ballets on them. Um, Robin Williams is a former dancer of my company, Goldman's Newark Dance Theater. She danced with us for over 40 years. Um, and I would often come in to strengthen and support her program because she's one of my babies. I was on her board when Prince gave the quarter of a million dollars when she danced at the yes. Apollo. Yes. See, I'm following you without realizing who you are and it's a, such a pleasure. Now, you also work with the group Blaze from Motown. Yes. And the video, We All Must Live Together, what was that like? That was incredible working with these young men, Kevin, and um, I don't want to say names because I'm not good with names, but they were such a talented and awesome group, so positive. Um, they commissioned a new ballet that I developed called Behind the Garden and um, produced it and gave me money to create this ballet, Kevin and the guys, um, just a wonderful experience and them being from Jersey and they had the same religious thoughts that I had, the same community thoughts, the same positive um, teaching and passing on information. They were like musical griots. Wow. So how did you stay relevant and market yourself during the, you know, a time when there was no internet and social media? I know the young people want to know, how did you do it? The word of mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started my first teaching experience was at the School of the Garden State Ballet in Newark. And Pepsi Bethel was teaching jazz there and I was his assistant. And when I turned 18, he released and he quit 
and said that I want him to um, teach the classes. And I was 18 and he wanted me to make a living. And out of that one act, my company formed out of a jazz workshop. We performed with the Garden State Ballet and got standing ovations. So they were like, you should have your own company. And they helped me, Fred Daniele and Evelyn Daniele. And Fred Daniele was one of the original Balanchine boys and the New York City Ballet. So he mentored me and helped me structure and choreograph. So that was um, an opportunity for me to be relevant. So we had performance after performance after performance and standing ovations after standing ovations. And then that begot Goldman's Newark Dance Theater. Wonderful. So what you have to do is put yourself out there and showcase your product. And if your product is good and it affect the people, which Alvin Ailey really imparted in me, that if you don't move the people, you're not really moving. And that it, you are telling the truth because you are where you are and you started in one place and you were there and you're here now. So how was being a dancer? Um, your having been a dancer and influenced you <clears throat> to creative, to create more and help others. Um, the reason why I started Gorman's Newark Dance Theater is because I was at a all white school and in Newark, the professional company was all white and they were on salary. And I was like, my kids are just as good I would like to um, have a platform for them to be salaried and um, make a living. And that's what happened. I had them on salary for three years, 44 weeks out of the year and toured nationally and internationally. And one of my dancers performed at the White House, winning the Presidential Scholar so it's been a, a wonderful experience because I'm passing on that information. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to you. It's a blessing to us. And it's a blessing to our youth. Now, what is some of your favorite music to do <clears throat> choreography to? It is so, my musical taste is so eclectic. I love classical music. I love contemporary jazz. I had the um, I had the privilege of working with um, Dizzy Gillespie on a project, and I choreographed a piece called "Sweet Dizzy" that was commissioned by the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, and um, he would tell me about his experiences. And he was a jitterbug dancer, little people know. So I tried to infuse all of that information and the joy and the balance of his music to create Sweet Dizzy. And you are unique. You are, <laughs> you are a true artist and you've enveloped everything, which is wonderful. Now, how has things changed in reference to opportunities for Black artists and dancers then from the 80s, the 90s, and early 20s? Has anything really changed? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, in the 80s and 90s, there was a great boom for Black dance and telling our stories and showing our images and great companies and choreographers came out of that period. And Garth Fagan and George Faison and Otis Talid, on and on and on. So um, it's not as much happening now. The smaller companies are being 
um, lost because they can't fund themselves. And um, they have a good product, but it's not easy to have someone to push them with publicity, with advertisement, with money, with donors, with supporters, with angels that believe in their products. And I've been fortunate that wherever I go, there have been people who believe in me, who believe in my product, who believe in my gift. And that was very supported by my pastor, the late Bishop James Gaylord, who said, Alfred, you're doing God's work in Newark. I would love one day that you would bring that to Harlem. And now after his death, here I am teaching in Harlem and the Harlem community and working with my church in liturgical dance also, Kelly Temple Church of God in Christ. As, as I said, you know, it's, it's remarkable. Our lives take us to so many places and so many people interact with each other and you never know, it's that six degree of separation. Separation, absolutely, absolutely. So, and one, one thing that I was really proud to work with uh, Bishop Nathaniel Townsley Jr., I would use his music so often and be inspired by his music. And I had the chance to um, direct and choreograph his production called Spirit. And we went to South Africa and to perform in South Africa before the people. And when we would do the movement of their, their culture, they would just go up in recognition because it just, it was to the bone. Mm. Yes, I mean, I, you know, I'm just visualizing and listening and it must have been a wonderful experience. Now, if you were not a choreographer, what would you be? Mm, <laughs> a teacher. I, it's my mission to touch and to pass on information. And if I can pass on information and life lessons, you know, to build um, our people up, our children up, and let them know that they're young kings and queens. Whatever I do, it would be in the manner of teaching of some sort, mentoring of some sort. But you but, are a teacher now. Yeah. You're a mentor now. You and and you're probably doing more as now than you would if you had to be in a certain place at a certain time every day. True. You're it's, a creative person. I'm walking in my purpose. Yes. And at this time, we have to take a commercial break and we will be back shortly with the Foxworth Theory. Please stay with us and Thank you, Mr. Gallman. Hello, I'm Eugenia Foxworth, inviting you to join me every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Foxworth Theory Podcast on the Voice America Variety Channel, the Harlem America Digital Network, and my very own YouTube channel. I interview the movers and shakers worldwide in art, culture, fashion, wellness, and business. So join me, Eugenia Foxworth, for an hour of lively talk and information on the Foxworth Theory, seen on my YouTube channel and heard Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Voice America Variety Channel and on the Harlem America Digital Network. Thank you. Welcome back to the Foxworth Theory, and I am your host, Eugenia Foxworth, and I am pleased to be with our guest, Mr. Alfred Gallman. If you're just tuning in, 
you still have time to learn and experience so much. So, Mr. Gallman, if you were not a dancer, what would you be doing now? I would be teaching, I would imagine, because it's so important for me to pass on information. I see myself as a griot, a person who passes on the culture, the knowledge, the information, the inspiration, the life lessons, the winning, the losing, the triumph, the triumph. Going from one episode to the next, going from one pandemic to the next but surviving. While carrying the torch. Yes. So how did being a dancer change your life for the better? Mm. <laughs> I, looking back, I never purposed any of this and it was divine intervention because um, I didn't know that I would be a professional dancer and I didn't know that that would be my life purpose and um, creating moments and creating history and creating, recreating history and highlighting special people like um, the great singer, um, and, and it just escapes me his name. Um, he's a high soprano and a male singer that people were not, they would think that he was a female because of the high range of his voice. And um, just a, a wonderful story he had from a family of 10 Little Jimmy Scott. Oh. The jazz legend. He gave me his memoirs. We became very good friends. We um, worked together at Newark Symphony Hall. And his story is so iconic of triumph over darkness. Mm -hmm. Losing his mother in a car accident and his siblings being separated at a young age, all 10 of them. And then for him to find his way in life and people because he had a disease, not a disease, but a ailment where his testicles did not descend. So he had this high, incredible voice and people thought he was a female, but he was a male and he had four wives and yeah <laughs> and lived this um incredible life of triumph and tragedy and um he was honored in his later years and with um people that really loved his voice um met, um all the great female singers patterned themselves billy holiday and um, Sarah Vaughn and they patterned their voice stylings after him, Nancy Wilson. And he was the person that I wanted to make sure that people didn't forget. So I choreographed the production called The Ballad of Jimmy Scott. Wow. That was quite a tribute. And that I, I did not know it. I'm sure that most of my audience does not know it as well. If in fact they know who Jimmy Scott is, I never knew that. And that's why it's important to tell our stories because if we don't tell them, who else is gonna tell them? And I, are they tell them correctly. I totally agree with you. Now, did you ever think about giving up and throwing the towel in? No, never. Not, never, not one day, because I could always, if I lost everything in life, I could always return and have the gift of dance and start all over again. 
because that gift never left me. It's beautiful, absolutely. And I can understand because after speaking to you, of course not. What challenges have you had to go through during downtimes like now with COVID and not being able to work or share your craft with the world like you really like to do? Zoom. Zoom is the word. <laughs> you would get people one on one, not mass classes, affect the life in 45 minutes with a private, private class, private instructions, so that um, you can develop the, the spirit within them. And you enjoyed it. I loved it. I, I, I was like, okay, we'll return to the studio eventually, but I'm okay right where we are. Because you can affect, you can affect, you can affect people. And you get to know them just not by dancing, but you know their spirit and you know their capabilities and you know their hopes and their dreams, their aspirations. When they're sad, you can pick them up. When they're not feeling well, you can heal because dancing is healing. Yes, that is true. I've heard that so much. And when you just watch you know, the, the performances, whether it's jazz or whether it's ballet or yeah. whether it, it, it's beautiful, even hip hop. Yes. So yeah. you, I mean, I, watching people years ago when they were standing on their head and spinning around like tops, I yeah. would watch them in LA uh, and I was like, and, and everybody else was watching. I mean, just amazing. Now, what skills have you learned as a dancer that makes you a great choreographer? I am, I can look at anything and see the beauty. I can see the beauty in someone walking across the street. I can see the beauty of a senior citizen getting on and off the bus. I can see the beauty of a person sitting up high on a bus and looking out and seeing their hopes and dreams. I can see people in daily walks creating great images and tapestries and movement and flow and ebbs and water and fire and life and spirit and God. Yes. Never forget that, never, we never forget that. And you know, it's hard, but you have told me so many things that you loved and what you did and what you appreciate, but maybe there's one thing that you love most about what you do. I mean, I, I think you've said everything, but is there one thing? Um, I think when I'm teaching or choreographing to see the dancer be transported in time and space and faith, um, that is so rewarding to see them become Harriet Tubman or Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King Jr or all the greats, to be Aretha, mm. to be all those Nina Simone and kings and queens and royalty. That's what's important to me, to see them transport and have flights of fancy. And you're a storyteller. Oh my God, you are a storyteller. It's great. Now tell us about some of the other challenges as a dancer. What have you had to sacrifice to be successful? 
well, you sacrifice your finances when people just take care of themselves. It, it's very easy. But when you're responsible for people, an organization, a group of people, you have to make sacrifices. And I've seen uh, my dancers pull up with BMWs and um, because they're not taking care of anybody else but themselves. But for me to support an organization, I would often sacrifice my finances to see that dream come to fruition. Yes. And if you could change anything about your career, what would it be? Um, I don't think changing an experience would benefit me. I think learning from it because you would go to, if I did this, if I could, if I should, but those um, falling down, no test, no testimony. It's given me a language. It's given me a, a spirit of victory and triumph because I've been low and I've been high and they taught me lessons and I learned from them, not repeating them, but learning from them to share with other people so that they don't make the same mistakes or they're given information to prevent it. So therefore, I would think that COVID normally would have an impact on you as an artist. But in listening to you, uh, it doesn't sound as though you slowed down or not. So how has it, I know it, you, you did the Zoom, but it, how it did made, it impact you in any other manner? It made the creative process deeper. So when I listen to music, I can have more of an effect. When I listen to poetry, when I listen to great speeches and great leaders, I can share with a deeper color, deeper color, deeper fabric. I can get more to it because of the struggle and the, the pandemic was, and it is just, something that only the strong survive. And what worries me is um, I had, um, we're, we're performing at the Montclair Museum and there's a new policy now that you have to be tested. You have to be um, shown that you don't have the, the COVID-19. Um, so it's important that the young people realize the struggle that we're in because they, they just don't wanna get vaccinated. They don't wanna get tested. And that cut down my dances tremendously because they were not aware and they're not educated in the science, which is horrible. I am so glad to hear you say this because um, I've had conversations with people and young people and I am astonished when we did digital <laughs> and they would say, oh, well, you know, you don't know how to do this. But right now I'm astonished because our kids are, have more tools to work with. Yes. And they're not listening to us, the art of not, science. Not listening and have their own minds and 
just falsely guided. I just, that truth is not nowhere near them. No. They these theories and this misinformation, it's so disturbing, but we pray. Yes, we do. And at this time, we have to take another commercial break, but we will be back to the Foxworth theory very shortly. And thank you for waiting and returning to us. Hi, I'm Eugenia Foxworth, the host of the Foxworth Theory Podcast, wishing you all a happy and a safe holiday season. Be sure to view me every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Foxworth Theory Podcast, heard on Voice America Variety Channel, the Harlem America Digital Network, and seen on my very own YouTube channel, The Foxworth Theory. When we felt like we didn't have anything, it was music that gave us a voice. We could tell each other in a song, but we couldn't say in words. Learning music changed us, making us even smarter. We learned to harmonize together. And now we can go anywhere, anywhere our dreams take us. Welcome back to the Foxworth Theory, and I'm your host, Eugenia Foxworth, and my special guest is Alfred Gallman. And I hope that you are absorbing everything that you are hearing today. What challenges have you had to go through during downtimes, like now with COVID, and not being able to work or share your craft with the world? like you really like to do? Zoom. Zoom is the word. <laughs> you would get people one-on-one, -on -one, not mass classes, affect the life in 45 minutes with a private, private class, private instructions, so that, um, you can develop the, the spirit within them. And you enjoyed it. I loved it. I, I, I was like, okay, we'll return to the studio eventually, but I'm okay right where we are. Because you can affect, you can affect, you can affect people. And you get to know them just not by dancing, but you know their spirit and you know their capabilities and you know their hopes and their dreams, their aspirations. When they're sad, you can pick them up. When they're not feeling well, you can heal because dancing is healing. Yes, that is true. I've heard that so much. And when you just watch you know, the, the performances, whether it's jazz or whether it's ballet or yeah. whether it, it, it's beautiful, even hip hop. Yes. So yeah. you, I mean, I, watching people years ago when they were standing on their head and spinning around like tops, I yeah. would watch them in LA uh, and I was like, and, and everybody else was watching. I mean, just amazing. Now, what skills have you learned as a dancer that makes you a great choreographer? I am, I can look at anything and see the beauty. I can see the beauty in someone walking across the street. I can see the beauty of a senior citizen getting on and off the bus. I can see the beauty of a person sitting up high on a bus and looking out and seeing their hopes and dreams. I can see people in daily walks creating great 
images and tapestries and movement and flow and ebbs and water and fire and life and spirit and God. Now, Mr. Gallman, what's yes. next for you? I would love to choreograph something that is so deep in my spirit that will have an effect on people to change their minds about the current state that we're in, politically, so divided, emotionally, so divided, um, family structures, so divided. I want to do a piece that can heal those sin-sick souls, those wounded souls, those forgotten souls. So as a reflection of the pandemic, I would love to do a piece called Heal. Oh. And I know you're going to do it. What would stop you? <laughs> and it's important that you have the, the right dancers to really pour into. Right, if you, you would. And you know the, the um, the things that you're saying is a part of my heart. When I mentioned to you the Uptown Dance Academy, you're familiar. Some of those children would never be dancers, but there are those who are now dancing in some of the- um, Prominent companies. Yes, all the prominent companies all around. ABT gave one of the young ballerinas a scholarship. And that's what I liked about Robin and what she did for the children. And when she did the Black Nutcracker and we were able to do it at the Apollo, yes. I called everybody I knew. And you know they were selling the tickets to the kids for $10. Bus loads were coming in from all over. But see, that's your spirit, what you do. And, and yeah. people don't understand. And I'm so fortunate because my dances is going to be on Broadway. I mean, there's dances that I've trained that are in The Lion King, that are in West Side Story, that are in The Temptations, that are in um, all the musicals that are up. They mm -hmm. are represented with Gallman's North Dance Theater members. Um, and they are, they're in institutions of learning. I have um, Professor Dwayne Cyrus who danced with Alvin Ailey, danced with Martha Graham, danced with the Lion King, who was my protege and muse. Um, now he's a professor at North Carolina University of Greensboro. And to see them go from there to there. And then having dances, dance with Paul Taylor, dance with Martha Graham, dance with Farlam, Alvin Ailey, of course, and Broadway, and teaching throughout the world is my dream. And it's, it's um, what we've started out to do and what's happening. One of you asked me, what would I like to do? And I would love to do a Broadway musical to um, speak about our background, our heritage, um, something called the river past and present, the triumph and the um, struggle of African-Americans coming from Africa to America and going through to today and showcasing the times and the struggles and the wins, the loss in a way that people can enjoy the storytelling, but learn. And I think Broadway would be a wonderful vehicle for that. Oh, it would, it's already, you're seeing it now with Hamilton. 
Yes. Kids never knew the history. And yes. now they do forget kids. A lot of adults, you know, didn't it? No. So to me, it's a great vehicle what you want to do, but I'm sure that it's going to come to be. There must be someone out there listening in the audience. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I do too. And um, I guess you really answered one of the questions I was going to ask you as what do you want the world to know most about you? But the question that we just spoke of, I mean, if you want to tell me more, then um. I would... I remember visiting with um, my first teacher, Pepsi Bethel. He was in a, a facility and he was not long to live and he had cancer. And I went to visit him a few days before he passed. And he said, Alfred, and his name is Alfred Pepsi Bethel. So I felt such a kinship. He said, I don't have any regrets. I lived my life the way I wanted to and I was very successful and I had my ups and my downs, but I would not do anything differently. But one thing I say to you, son, you have a gift and you take that gift and don't hold it to yourself. Don't be selfish with your gift. You pass it on. And you passing it on will create me. It will create you because you will always live because you will have people, spirit that lives in them and that lives in you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yes, I mean, it's, um, I can only imagine the number of students and your friends that have learned so much uh, by being around you. Also, you're, you're a comforting person. You know, I'm here and you're over there and we're on our podcast, but you seem that as if you're right here within my space. And- um, As I am. Yeah. <laughs> the spirit can go everywhere and if you carry the light with you it will shine and i want to bring light to people because we have enough darkness yes we do indeed we do and if you could change anything in the world anything what would it be i think i know the answer but i want it from you? I want to have a space that would be a refuge for people. Hurt, healed, happy, sad, that they can have a voice through dance. A Gallman's Dance Theater School that can develop nurture, mentor, cultivate, discover the inner voices of all the people that come. Now, how can people follow you and how can they contact you? Because you have a dream and as I feel, there has to be someone that is in our listening audience that may know someone or may be interested, but I'm sure everyone is interested in the story that you've told us and would like to continue following you. So how can they find you? They can find me on Facebook, Alfred Gallman on Facebook, and my story and my friendship starts there. And you can reach me at 973, I'm sorry, 917-736-3394 for information and um, inspiration. And that is very 
That is very, very important. Would you repeat your number again in case someone missed it? 917-736-3394. And that's Ballman's Dance Theater. And we are now um, housed at Faison's Firehouse Theater, where I'm teaching classes on Mondays and Saturdays to children, teens, and adults at all levels, ballet, point, jazz, liturgical dance, male dance, stretching, choreography, and improvisation. I was ready for you to say that because as I drive by on 124th Street, West 124th yeah. Street, yeah. I, I said, hmm, he didn't mention he's teaching there. So <laughs> I'm glad I asked you that question. I'm glad you did it also. <laughs> and at this point, I would like to thank you so much, Mr. Gallman, for being here and telling your story to my audience on the Foxworth Theory. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank our audience. I'd like to thank our team and the Harlem America Digital Network and Voice America. And I wish everyone a beautiful day and stay safe. And thank you, Alfred Dahlman. Thank you so much. Dancers Against Cancer's mission is to create an alliance in the dance community that provides financial support and inspiration to dance educators, choreographers, dancers, and their families who have been impacted by cancer. The I'm a Dancer Against Cancer campaign was founded in 2012 in response to the loss of a young dancer from cancer. Since then, it has become a beacon of hope in the dance community, uniting dancers all over the nation. In 2014, Dancers Against Cancer became an official 501c3 to continue to provide financial assistance to dance educators, dancers, and family members impacted by cancer. To date, DAC has proudly raised over $2 million in donations that directly benefit those in need. Dancers Against Cancer has proudly donated over $4 million to dancers, teachers, and parents within the dance community battling cancer. These donations assist families with paying their medical bills, insurance coverage, dance tuition, and more. DAC is also a proud ally of many cancer-related charities. Some include the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Wellness and Research Center, as well as Right Action for Women. DAC Hope Studios are a great way to get your studio involved in fundraising. An annual donation of $1,000 is required to become an official Hope Studio. The support from dancers and dance studios has been essential in helping many individuals battling cancer. Our goal with Hope Studios is to create a community of support for our dance families going through a difficult time. To become a Hope Studio, visit our website for more information. So how can you help? You can raise money for Dancers Against Cancer by purchasing any of our merchandise at car and rainbow dance competitions, as well as on our website. You can also do a one-time or recurring donation on our website at imadanceragainstcancer.org. If you have any questions, you can ask your competition director or visit our website's contact page. Dancers Against Cancer is grateful for the support of the dance community, and we will continue to make a difference in the lives of dancers fighting cancer.